humans, it's just Martine and welcome to the beginning of another 24 in 48 hour readathon. Like last time, this is going to be more chill than some of my past attempts. I'll read however much I read, but I do have the bug for reading a lot this weekend and I've got quite a bit of time. So we will see what happens. But my main priority this week is taking care of myself. So this is mainly just like a weekend reading vlog-esque type thing this time because this weekend, I'm right in the middle of tech weeks. So I had tech week last week and I have hell week next week. And so this is my time to recuperate in between. So I will not be forsaking sleep or anything of that nature. And if I feel like I wanna stop reading, then I will stop reading. I need to maintain my sanity. It's currently 9.41 p.m., 9.42. It just changed before my eyes. So it's 9.42 p.m. and I'm planning on starting at 10 p.m. I haven't even done my 30 minutes of reading that I have Bookly ask me to do every day. Hopefully I'll read a bit before bed, at least for half an hour, and uh, and we'll see where we get. So far out of the books that I'm planning on reading this weekend, I've started two books that I'm going to be continuing into this weekend, and there are other books that I'm hoping to read. The first book that I'm part of the way into is A Light Too Bright. I'm borrowing this from one of my friends here at school. When she went home, she was like, have you read this book? And I was like, no. And she was like, you need to. And I said, do you have a copy I can borrow? So here it is. And I'm, I'm a little over a hundred pages into it and enjoying it so far. So I'm excited to tell you more about it later. And then I'm also part of the way into, I think maybe 20% Clara and the Sun by Kazuo Ishiguro. I love Kazuo Ishiguro's work. Never Let Me Go is one of my favorite books. Remains of the Day is the only other one by him that I've read so far, and I did enjoy that one. I think I gave it like a four stars, but Kazuo Ishiguro books are almost better on reread. Like Never Let Me Go, the first time I read it, I think I gave it a four stars, and the second time I gave it a five. So I don't know, they really grow on you, and I've been waiting to read this one for a while, but I finally said, Martine, what are you saving this for? Read it now, it's available at the library right now, so read it. So I'm 20% of the way into that, and once it turns 10 o'clock, I might be starting there. Here's to a weekend of reading. Good morning, it's 9.44 a.m. And this morning I've been doing some reading. So last night I read and I got to like 25% of the maidens. And I made a little more progress on Clara and the Sun, but not much. And then this morning I listened to the maidens while I got ready and I got to like 58%. I was reading A Light Too Bright and I read 94 pages of that. So I'm about three hours into reading, which is pretty good progress, but I'm about to go and run some errands with a friend. I have some thoughts on the maidens so far. So I read The Silent Patient, which is by the same author, and I forget what happens in that book because I just forget books as soon as I read them pretty much. But I remember it being like pretty okay. And this one, I have some specific issues with because they did it. They mentioned a forensic psychologist and I study forensic psychology. So I'm here with things to say. First of all, the main character is a psychotherapist. So she's not the forensic psychologist and she readily admits that. She is trying to use psychotherapy to profile the killer, which there's a couple things that bother me about that. The use of profiling is like one of her main investigative techniques. Profiling is very much like a supportive technique that can help and is usually only pulled in when it's like really, really desperate. So the fact that even the investigators pulled in an actual forensic psychologist to work on a profile before it was even labeled a serial killer and like only one day after it happened is like very strange. <laughs> Don't love how much profiling is, is happening, but she is asking questions around other people. It's a total, it's a totally different discussion to have about accidental PIs in books and whether or not they're obstructing justice or interfering in the legal process because even if they solve things it's like they mess up the actual investigation and there are ways that things are done for specific reasons. So even the inspector found her snooping around a literal crime scene like she saw a dead body and everything and he was like if I catch you here again I will arrest you. <laughs> That's just been on my mind a bit. I think the thing that bothered me the most so far is her initial instinct that the killer is a psychopath. So first of all, she had this assumption before there was ever a second body. So again, it's not a serial killer. So take any statistics about serial killers, throw them away. We're focusing on one murder, typically not performed by psychopaths. Okay, so we get a second body. It's a serial killer. Also, not always psychopaths. <laughs> Statistically, most serial killers are not psychopaths. You can think of really famous ones that were like Ted Bundy, but not all of them are. So her initial thought, someone's dead, a psychopath killed them, 
just really bothered me. But then she said, he's a psychopath, he's really sadistic. Sadism is a separate paraphilia and is not at all related to psychopathy, like scientifically. So you have psychopathy and then you have sadism. Sadism is a paraphilia, which is specifically a sexual disorder and nothing sexual has been indicated at the crime scene so far, like not one single thing. So it couldn't actually be sadism in that sense. So she shouldn't be using the word sadism and she really shouldn't be saying that psychopathy and sadism are equivalent, which is what she was saying, because they're not. So that's really bothering me right now. And I know it's such a specific thing that I should just like let it go, but sometimes things are like really glaring and it's like if the author even looked into this at all he would know that he was wrong like i don't know it just especially if you're going to have a character who's a forensic psychologist to the then just blatantly like say stuff that's really incorrect is like really bothersome i'm also concerned about the perspective that we have from the person who seems to be the killer because I'm getting some vibes of dissociative identity disorder, which is not a very well supported disorder and is almost never, almost never actually um, present in serial killers. So I hope that doesn't happen because that will ruin the whole book for me. So I guess this could be a spoiler alert if I end up rating this really low. <laughs> that trope has ruined a book for me in the past. So I hope it doesn't happen, but that's where I am. I'm gonna go run errands and then I'll get Back to reading. Guys, one of my stops was the Dollar Tree for something that is not books, and yet, am I getting new books today? Absolutely. It's almost 4 p.m., and I'm sure you're wondering how I got here. So I ran errands with my friend, and I got back around one, and then my sister and I, we decided to go for a walk. So we went on a three mile walk, and we were like, that's enough. So I went to go up to my room, and I looked down, my ID card, it's not there. I'm like, oops, I dropped my ID card. So we turn around, start retracing our steps on the like mile and a half that we went on, certain we were gonna find it in the first five minutes. No, we walked a mile and a half, it's nowhere. Get back to my room, look around in here, it's nowhere. I've lost it, it's gone forever. I call security, they say, well, we'll keep an eye out for it. I get a call back from security, somebody just turned it in. So if you come over here now, you can get it. So I walk half a mile there, half a mile back, that's an extra mile. If you were wondering, so now we're at like five and a half miles and now I have my ID back, but I have not read since like 9.50 a.m. And uh, so now back to reading and gonna rehydrate myself and have a snack cause I just walked five and a half miles. I just got back from the homecoming carnival, which I went to with my sister and hung out with some of our friends there too. I got this cool bucket hat. I've been wanting a bucket hat for a really long time. And now I got one for free, which is always great. And then I got a homecoming shirt, a black t-shirt. They know me too well. The time when student life was like, we should stop ordering white t-shirts for events and start doing black changed my life. Uh, now they buy it and they're like, you can reverse tie dye it. And they have a reverse tie dye station, but I just with the black t-shirt. There was an option for like a custom street sign, but that booth was really busy and I didn't have any good ideas, but custom whiteboards. So I made one with a picture of me and my sister, uh, which is super cute. Homecoming for the win. I have 30 minutes of this book left. So I'm hoping to finish this and then probably focus mainly on Clara and the sun until I fall asleep tonight. I'm at like six hours of reading. So today I have taken lots of breaks from reading, but that's fine because I am accomplishing the goal of this weekend, which is restoring my soul. And I've spent a great day with great people and it's been good. And now I'm going to end the day with great books and it will be fantastic. It's 8.50 and I just finished A Light to Write by Samuel Miller and I am giving this four stars. I really, really, really enjoyed this book. It's got so many interesting elements. It's about this guy whose grandpa has been dead for like five years now, but he was a famous American author and a week before he died, he disappeared. And then a week later he showed up dead and they don't know what he did in that week before he died, but he ended up like across the country and he also had really, really bad Alzheimer's. So there are discussions about Alzheimer's, which is great. The main character in this is never expressly stated to have schizophrenia, but he has both positive and negative symptoms of schizophrenia. So I'm pretty sure he's supposed to be portrayed as having schizophrenia, but it's never like explicitly said on the page. There are also other discussions of like trauma, definitely some major trigger warnings in here uh, for depression and such. I loved the like scavenger hunt-esque 
aspect of this plus road trip-esque aspect but it's like a train trip instead of a road trip and i did enjoy the like interspersed poems and the ending was so satisfying like definitely one of the strongest parts of the book was the ending which is not always the case with books sometimes they're like yes 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 oh but this was like this is good this is good ending i had a really fantastic time reading this thanks to my friend who recommended it and lent it to me it is indeed a fresh incarnation of the great american road trip novel and it will probably appear to devotees of john green and gail foreman so and it's a debut novel which is super fun. When was it published? 2018. This was definitely a good one. I don't know what I'm going to be reading for the rest of the night, but at least while I clean up my room a little bit, I'm going to listen to some more of The Maidens. It's just past 10 p.m. I'm about to go to bed, but I just finished The Maidens. I gave it three stars. Luckily, those things that were really bothering me near the beginning it didn't have much of an impact on like the end. I did not see the last twist coming but it was just an okay read for me. So I don't really have many thoughts on it, to be honest with you. If you like thrillers that are like set around schools and stuff, then I might recommend this one. If you like books where the main character has like a lot of grief that they're working through, you know. Also, then I like realized that the ending was a callback to The Silent Patient and realized I really don't remember anything about The Silent Patient. So I read a quick plot summary and I went, there's no way I've ever read this. Like, I don't recognize this at all, but I know I have read it. So like, <laughs> rough. Like I was reading the summary and I was like, no, but I've read it. Like, I promise I've read it. I know when I read it. Winter break, my sophomore year of college, whatever. Good night. It's just past 10 a.m. on Sunday morning and I just finished Clara and the Sun, which I'm giving four stars, which in my opinion is a common occurrence for the first read through of a Kazuo Ishiguro book. Now, I haven't read The Remains of the Day a second time, so I don't know if I would have given it a five stars a second time instead of the four, but that's what happened with Never Let Me Go. And I think that's just because as an author, Kazuo Ishiguro doesn't like to tell you anything. And so it takes like a while to get comfortable with what the story is trying to say. And then when you go back for a reread, you can like really dig into it. I'm gonna let this simmer in my mind for a while and hopefully sometime in the future, I'll reread it but I did really, really love it. And the discussions about uh, rationality and religion and artificial intelligence and what it means to be a human, which is like a central part of all of his works is trying to explore what it means to be a human. So this is about an artificial friend who gets taken into this household where she's to be the companion to this teenage girl who is quite ill. It's just about that relationship and what happens from there as the girl grows up and Clara, the artificial friend, grapples with her own potential humanity and the humanity of those around her. Definitely not an author who's good for people who hate ambiguity because he's all about it, but I enjoyed it. And uh, now I'm probably going to jump to when no one is watching. I started that this morning and I'm like 17% of the way through and enjoying it so far. So back to that. It's just past 1.30 and I finished When No One Is Watching by Alyssa Cole and I'm giving that four stars. It was really, really good. Definitely unsettling. It's been really popular on booktube so I'm not going to talk like much about what it's about. But in case you haven't heard about it, it's this thriller about this neighborhood that's uh, going through gentrification and it's got lots and lots and lots of great discussions on race and corporations and all of those things and it's definitely fascinating like held my attention I mean I read it all today so obviously it held my attention I would definitely read more Alyssa Cole in the future so that's exciting and I also just hit the 12 hour mark for reading this weekend which it's pretty good. I think I'm going to start another book. I might take a break to watch some YouTube here in a bit, but for right now, I'm going to keep reading. <sighs> you just missed the very dramatic one tear falling down my whole cheek. I just finished five feet apart. <laughs> five stars. <laughs> I can't even put my thoughts into words right now. It's like a chronic illness rep. The point of like living your life to the fullest but also taking care of yourself even though what you need is different than others forbidden love bittersweetness it's just it's all there <laughs> pretentious twaddle characters i loved it 
I loved it. I need to watch the movie. I'm so glad there is a movie starting five feet apart. Where do I watch the movie? <laughs> the last time the book made me cry, it was the second Aristotle and Dante book, and I didn't even like that book. <laughs> but this book I loved. I can't watch it tonight. I can't watch it tonight. But I will be watching it. Oh my god, I can't. <laughs> okay, so it's just before 8 p.m. And this afternoon, I read The Ultimate Gift, which I never told you about, but I gave 3.5 stars. And it's just about like, the things that are important in life. Love, day, gratitude, giving, dreams, laughter, family, problems, learning, friends, money, work, all those things. It's basically a pretty extended parable. I appreciated it. And then I read Five Feet Apart and it destroyed me. Please wear masks to protect people. Please be aware that everybody is, is fighting something you don't know about. Be kind. Read this book. I know it's it, it's been popular, but like if you haven't read this book, read it immediately. Especially during COVID, it's just like oof. Especially as somebody with a chronic illness, it's just oof. <sighs> this is also the first time I've read a book with chronic illness rep, and I like really, 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 really loved it. I read Get a Life, Chloe Brown for the chronic illness rep, and the illness rep was great, but I didn't love the book. But this was a great book and about that like yes the illness is like very front and center for this one it takes place in a hospital and that is not like the reality of a lot of chronic illnesses i i'm not in a hospital with my chronic illness but like this book was so good i read this weekend for like 15 and a half hours i finished six books i was in the middle of some of them already i read a light too bright clara in the sun the maidens when no one is watching the ultimate gift and five feet apart it was an incredible weekend. I can't believe the book actually made me cry. I'm so happy about it. <laughs> the end. If you like this video, go ahead and give it a big thumbs up and comment down below. What was the last book that made you cry? And subscribe for more reading, writing, and college lifestyle content. And until next time, bye humans, bye.